The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. Glory to you, Lord Christ. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found people selling cattle and sheep and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, Take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, What sign can you do for us? Can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, This temple has been under construction for 46 years, and you will raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, Lord Christ. exchanging Roman coins for temple coins because there was a temple tax that, that all Jews were supposed to pay each year. But that couldn't be paid in those uh, pagan coins, so uh, they required temple coins. But there were money changers there, and as, as they often will, making money off of that. Okay, And the high priests, the Sanhedrin, were all making money on top of that. Same with the animals. It had 
become a system where people, uh, instead of bringing their animals from home, right, you've got to make this 40 or 50 mile trek or whatever, we don't want to, we don't want to haul our sacrificial animals, we'll just buy some once we get there. Well, that's not the way the system was supposed to work. Right? It wasn't intended to be a matter of convenience. It wasn't something that they were just supposed to do to get through. And so the whole system had, had broken down. And this is what Jesus encounters when he enters the temple. Now, the temple would have been a massive area. It wasn't just a, a single building like we think of. It was a massive, the temple mount. So there would have been walls, and inside those walls there would be more set of walls. And you go further and further in to the more important places, at the center of which being the Holy of Holies. We talked about that before. That was the place, the sanctuary, where God was said to reside on earth. That was where the high priest could only go in, only went in once a year. He was the only person that went in. I told you before that they tied a rope to his leg because they felt if you saw God, you would die. And uh, since no one else could go in there, if he died while he was in there, they wanted a way to get him out. Um, <laughs> this is also where we see the massive curtain. This curtain that separates God, God's presence on earth from the people. It's that same curtain that we hear torn in two at Jesus' death. This, this thing that uh, separates us from God was ripped in two when Jesus died on the cross. So Jesus enters these outer courtyards of the, of the temple and he sees this going on. And he's upset. He's upset. But what does he do? He says the first thing he does, now I'm adding sit down, but I, I'm going to say he sits down and he makes a whip of cords. That may not seem like a big deal. To me, that's a big <coughs> deal. When I'm angry, I don't always take time to uh, sit down and think things through and, and make a tool that I can use to... No, he sat down. And I, I don't know if he carried cord around in his pocket, but I doubt it. He had to get some cord, take the time to make it, and then he goes about cleansing the temple. Now, it's been argued over the years, it's been said many times, that, that Jesus was angry at this moment. Probably so. In fact, the disciples say that they remember, and this is a quote from Isaiah, that zeal for my father's house will consume me. He felt strongly about the state of his father's house. He was upset. Absolutely. But oftentimes we hear people talk about this, Jesus being angry. And it's used in the context of justifying our own anger. Of justifying our own outrage of things that we see around us. Injustices that we see in the world. Injustices we see directed towards us. Now over the last 2,000 years, theologians have gone to great effort to talk about Jesus' anger in this situation. And there's all kinds of phrases and thoughts about it, but ultimately, the phrases generally come down to something along the lines of righteous anger. They try to differentiate what Jesus did here from, I'm going to call it, worldly anger. They call it righteous anger. Now, why do they do this? Why do they go to such effort. Why is it a big deal to say, well, Jesus was angry? There was something going on that shouldn't have been. It made him mad. So what? So what? What's the difference between righteous anger and regular anger? I'd say first and foremost, in order to experience righteous anger, I think you probably have to be righteous. <laughs> <laughs> That's the key point here. If you remember nothing else today, I think righteous anger requires a righteous one to experience it. And to be fully righteous, to be fully right with God, is, as far as I know, the claim of only one person, Jesus. Now, in saying this, I'm not saying that we should not be angered at injustice, that we should not be angered when people are mistreated. 
I'm not saying that we shouldn't be compelled from that anger to do something about it. But we mustn't confuse the two. We mustn't say that because something makes me angry and because it seems to me unjust, that therefore my anger is righteous. Because 99 times out of 100, my experience of myself and of others is that that anger is more often directed at people, known and unknown, a particular person or group, more so than the problem. Our anger tends to go towards people. And I'm not saying that that's in and of itself wrong when people do things that are cruel and unjust. I think it's okay to be angry. But we have to be careful to not attach judgment, anger, and then importantly, hatred to that experience. And here's, and for me, how you tell the difference. If I see a situation, and that situation upsets me, and I get angry at the situation and angry at the person, how do I react? Do I do something about it? That's one outlet. Or do I go home and stew about that person or persons in that situation? Am I holding on to anger? <clears throat> hatred, frustration about the people involved. I think if that's the case for me, then that says that my anger is not what God intends. Because first and foremost, God intends us to be in right relationship with God and with one another. And while I can't control what others do, in other words, I can't because I want a relationship to be right. That doesn't mean it's going to be right. There are two sides to it. I can control my half of that relationship. So if I'm harboring anger, hatred, towards someone, some group, then I'm not doing my part. Now also, if I see injustice in the world, and it bothers me, and I'm moved by that, and I do nothing about it, I'm also not doing my part. But for us as fallen human beings, all too often those things just get all mixed together, right? What's happening here is wrong, so it's okay for me to be angry and to be uh, filled with this sense of hate for this other person or person. I don't think that's what God intended for us. And so Jesus' righteous anger that we see in the temple is not about the fact that he <coughs> hates those people doing that or that he hates uh, any hates what's going on. He hates that his father's house has become a marketplace, that it's being used for something it was never intended for. That angers him, and rightfully so. My encouragement for you this morning is that any time you experience this anger, Think about what it's doing to your heart. Think about what it's doing to your life and your relationships. Not just to that person, because that person may be on TV, that person may be somebody you'll never meet in all your life. So there's really no relationship there. But I guarantee you, if you're angry, it's affecting the relationships of those around you. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but I know many of you have come to me because you or your spouse, someone is really angry with such and such thing that's happening in the world and it's affecting your relationships. There's a proper place for anger. It's not in your heart. It's doing something with it. Constructive in the world to make a difference. How do we do this? We ask God for help. I'm not sitting up here trying to say that this is easy. Our fallen human nature kind of makes us want to, to fall into that trap of pointing fingers, of blaming, of being angry, because quite frankly, that's the easy way out, right? 
it's much easier for me to say, well, these people are evil and they're bad and, and they should stop what they're doing. That's a whole lot easier than me doing something about it. Ask God to help you do those things which we cannot do for ourselves. I've said it to you over and over and over again. As Christians, we believe that God can do all things. He can do things that we can neither imagine nor understand. But we have to want that help. We have to want to let go of the anger, to let go of the hurt, to deal constructively with the injustice that we see in the world and not be driven by it, not be overwhelmed or overcome by it, not to have that get in the way of our relationship with the Lord. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for this day and for all the many ways that you bless us. Pray that you'd help us to recognize